We're going to look at the properties of water that include polarity, cohesion, adhesion, capillary action, uh, temperature control, and then <laughs> underneath temperature control, we want to talk about how the specific heat of water, or specifically the high specific heat of water, um, evaporative cooling, and then of course density, floating ice, and solute, solvent, and solution. So polarity is the unequal sharing of electrons. They make up the water molecule <clears throat> polar, meaning that it has poles on opposite ends. The oxygen being negatively charged, the hydrogen being positively charged, gives the water molecule poles, one side feeling negative, one side feeling positive. So if you're envisioning a glass of water sitting there, um, the positive hydrogen of one water molecule is attracted to the negative oxygen in another water molecule. Cohesion is the attraction of the molecule for other molecules of the same kind. So how much does water like itself? I guess you could say there's hydrogen bonds between water molecules. These hydrogen bonds hold them together and it increases the cohesive force uh, between each water molecule. So the property allows liquids to resist any sort of like internal force. That's how we get that surface tension property that allows like water striders to go across the surface of the water. But this cohesion property allows for the transportation of water and nutrients against gravity in plants. It's because water is also attracted to other water molecules. They stick together and follow almost like in a chain, if you will, or a group all the way up the xylem uh, of the leaf. Adhesion is the clinging of one molecule to a different molecule. So how much does water like to cling to other things besides water? Now this has to do with that polarity of water. In plants, it allows water to cling to the cell walls inside of the xylem of the leaf, and that clinging to the walls resists the pull of gravity downward. And that's how water goes through the, um, the roots, through the leaf, or up the stem, through the leaf system. It's the adhesion that water molecules have uh, to stick to the inside walls of the xylem. Here we have a demonstration inside of the xylem of how adhesion and cohesion properties are. Uh, this is a really good demonstration, uh, I'm sorry, demonstration of intermolecular forces. Water molecules are cohesively attracted to not only themselves, but just due to their polarity, they can also be um, adhesive to other types of material. And it's, it's this that gets to move water from the roots to the stems to the leaves without a heavy use or much use at all of ATP. And it's against gravity. Capillary action is the upward movement of water due to the forces of cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. When adhesion is greater than the cohesion. So a water molecule will adhere more so to the inside of the cell walls of the xylem, even greater than it will cohere to itself, we get this capillary action, the movement of water upwards against the flow of, against the, <laughs> the flow of gravity, yeah, the flow of gravity. Um, this is important because it will bring with it you know, uh, water and nutrients, and that assists the plant in transpiration. Temperature control. Let's see, specific heat of water is water's ability to resist temperature change. And how does it do that? And it's all contributed to these fascinating hydrogen bonds that aren't really bonds, they're more of an attraction. So heat must be absorbed in order to break those hydrogen bonds but heat is released when those hydrogen bonds form. I'm gonna read that one more time and kind of let it sink in because it is a property that is counterintuitive oftentimes to students. Heat must be absorbed to break the bonds in the hydrogen bond. 
but heat is released when the hydrogen bond forms. So when water forms a hydrogen bond with another water molecule, heat is released. And it's this property that gives water a high specific heat and allow it, it allows it to re, really resist the change in temperature, essentially increasing its stability. The reason that the specific heat is so important to living things is because it definitely allows water to resist temperature change regardless of what's going on in the air. So ocean species, marine life, other aquatic life, they don't like a lot of temperature change too fast and definitely not a lot, you know, within the realm of their seasons. So large bodies of water, they can absorb heat in the daytime and then release it at night, causing like this stabilizing effect. And organisms, they can resist changes in their own internal body temperature because they are full of water. Evaporative cooling, it's also called heat of vaporization, if you're me, because you're old. <laughs> but water has a um, high specific heat, and it also has a high heat of vaporization. A high heat of vaporization means that it's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to require a lot of energy to get this molecule to move from its liquid state to its gas state. So it does resist uh, the change from liquid to gas well. The molecules that are on the surface of the water have the highest kinetic energy. They're going to leave as a gas first. This is important because this is how uh, Earth's overall temperature is moderated. The air is full of water. There's water vapor everywhere. So by there being um, an ability to you know, for the water to resist changes in state or its ability to leave as a gas, we can get this stabilizing evaporative cooling effect. And this also helps stabilize temperatures in lakes and ponds, streams. It basically prevents terrestrial organisms from being overheated. So like when we sweat and it prevents leaves from wilting too quickly or too fast, in the, warm, in the warm sun, density of water, perhaps the most interesting of all, because water is the least dense when it is a solid. So as water starts to solidify, it expands and becomes less dense. Because these hydrogen bonds, when we start to cool water, let's just say water is like 50 degrees Celsius, and we start to cool it, cool it to 45, cool it to 40. As it becomes cooler, it does get denser and denser and denser. The water molecules become closer and closer together. But when it reaches 4 degrees Celsius, the hydrogen bonds expand and allow the water to float so that by the time it freezes, when it's at 0 degrees Celsius, as a solid, ice is floating, water is actually floating. It is less dense as a solid than it was as cold water. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, this allows for marine life to survive and also freshwater um, aquatic organisms to survive because if, the, if water froze all the way at the bottom first, then all of the nutrients and organisms that live on the bottom, the, the benthotic life would no would cease to exist. They'd be frozen in the wintertime. But they're protected under a sheet of ice that is frozen that is along the top. And so it still al allows life to continue on underneath the sheets of ice in the winter. So hydrogen bonds cause water molecules to form this crystalline structure as it freezes. So just try to imagine a 3D crystal structure of ice. You know, it's going to make many, many hydrogen bonds. And, um, you know, if you think about it, how many hydrogen bonds can each water molecule make with its neighbor? All right, a solvent. Three words you got to know, solution, solvent, and solute. 
So a solution is a homogeneous mixture, it's two or more substances kind of all spun together. The solvent is the dissolving agent in a solution and the solute is being dissolved. So if I have salt water, salt water is my solution. Salt is my solute and water is my solvent. Commit this to memory, like dissolves like. Polar things like other polar things and dissolve in each other. Ionic compounds have a positive and negative end. An ionic compound is a metal and a non-metal bonded together. Usually the metal is positive and usually the non-metal is negative. So when they're together, they have this partial positive, partial negative end. When they enter water, let's just say, like my example here is salt water, basically all of the sodium are going to be surrounded because sodium is positive. They're going to be surrounded by that negatively partial charged oxygen. And chlorine, because it's negative, it's going to be surrounded by those partially positive charged hydrogens on water and pull the uh, salt crystallization structure apart. So ionic compounds do dissolve into their ions in water and it's partially it's that partial positive interaction of those polar molecules or the polar properties of water that causes this to interact.